Hi, this is Firestarters TV. I'm Pamela Signeri, and today I'm talking with Brandon Chaplin. And in Australian culture, there is nothing more powerful than a football club. And you're the chaplain at Port Power, yeah. which is, um, you know, that, that, that's a formidable power in AFL these days. And you, you have a unique opportunity to actually enlighten all of us uh, with what the mechanics of the, the football club are. Because I said to you earlier that, you know, how do you handle it with these young men when they've worked the whole year towards September and then you're not there? And you said something really interesting that I hadn't considered. Yeah, well, Pam, the interesting thing for footballers is they're obviously uh, they were the sort of the eight year old boy that had the dream of footy and were good at it mm -hmm. and were passionate about it and worked mm -hmm. hard and came through the ranks and mm -hmm. sort of get plucked out of nowhere. And as an 18 year old, all of a sudden have a bit of fame and a bit of fortune. But they're still young guys who are dealing with relationships, leaving home. And of mm -hmm. course, like what happens with life, there is. Um, uh, at times relationship breakdown and mm -hmm. there's grief and there's loss and so yes a, a footballer uh, uh, wants to play finals a footballer aspires to play in a sure. grand final and win a premiership mm -hmm. but after 20 seasons of being a chaplain uh, at the elite level mm -hmm. um, of course there are bigger things than than even that and mm -hmm. so you know it's sometimes it's relationships and that's sometimes it's the loss of a mate Mm. Um, and in our football club, you know, we've had some some tragedy, and so yes. sometimes they 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 they're bigger than bigger than September. Even though I'm sure at the moment uh, it's September, and yeah. our team's not playing in the finals. They wish they were there, of course. but of course there was always bigger stuff. They can always barrack for the crows, though. I, at Port Adelaide, I would doubt that, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> but you you've had more than your share at Port Adelaide of grief. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So we've yeah we've had a fairly big period of time. Yeah. Um, you know, over the years, over twenty seasons, I've seen you know support staff. You mm. know, because there are old guys. There's all kinds of volunteers and people that support like like I do yeah. in different yeah. roles. Yeah. But yeah, we had a, a significant team manager a few years ago who was much loved. He 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 got leukemia and died. Then we mm. had a player, which was a national story. Yes. Um, he died in Las Vegas, and mm. and that caused a great deal of pain in our football club and amongst mm. the playing group. And mm. then um, just because last, it was a team trip too, wasn't it? Was it was a team trip, yeah. yeah. And then um, last year, another big story: um, uh, the, Phil Walsh, who had been mm. the Crows coach, but had been an assistant at Port Adelaide for a long time over yeah. a long period, yeah. uh, passed away. So those things are real, real. They're big. They're massive for everybody, the whole mm. footballing community. Mm. Um, but of course, if you, if you have a personal relationship, th there's deep loss and grief harder, of those things. Much know? harder. Yeah. But that's the downside. But there's lots of good news in what you're seeing working with the players, I'm sure. Lots of positive things that come out. That it makes your job a joy rather than a hard grind all the time. Yeah, well, being around the energy of young men who are you know, uh, uh, our footballers, it means that generally they've got a healthy lifestyle, they've mm. got aims and goals and dreams, yeah. they're united in that whole team thing, they're working together uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. towards something, they're focused, they're driven, mm. um, and as I age, uh, it's great to be around that kind of energy, it's that kind of focus, of course, it's fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and they are usually um, outstanding young men, so we see yeah. them as footballers taking marks, tackling, kicking, mm. but off the field they are quality young men and mm. uh, certainly mm. the current batch that we've got mm -hmm. uh, currently, you know, you're, you're going to make an assessment about their footballer ability, but I'm just I'm always impressed there how articulate, how focused, how yeah. generous they are and a lot of yeah. people don't see what they do off the field, you know, they visit kids in hospital. It's and a they, shame really. Yeah, so we sometimes hear the negative story yeah. or the the player that went off the rails and the media jumps on it, but um, in terms of their time, mm. very generous, the, mm. the, the overwhelming majority mm. of AFL footballers. Yeah. And we want to hear the good news stories yeah. because, you know, they're, they're 
um, as I said to you, I was chatting on the show with Andrew Marks from West Adelaide. Yep. And he was saying that, you know, we, the viewing public, forget yeah. that, uh, particularly in his situation, a lot of these guys work full time as yeah. well. Yeah. So they're a huge commitment, but they're, they're people first. Yeah, yeah. And they've been pushed into this place of almost being an idol, which yeah. isn't healthy yeah. in anyone's language. Yeah. And then you wonder why they can't cope with it. But, but your job is to navigate through that stormy water f with them. Yeah. Not for them, yes. but really with them. Yeah, so th th there's lots of great people at a football club, you know, uh, people who are coaches have got to that, not only because they're great at strategy and communication, but yeah. they've normally have made the top level. Sure. So they've know, know how to negotiate some of the pressures that they have. Yeah. Um, the club environment often creates an accountability anyway. Mm, mm. Um, but also, the, my, my, my kind of role is, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a safe, neutral, confidential person. I'm not mm. arranging mm. their contract. I'm no. not picking them in the team. I'm not a threat to them. Mm. I'm a listening ear and I'm a person who's just not interested in whether they're kicking the ball well or marking it or playing well. I'm interested, how's it going at home? Yeah. How's it going with your family? How's it going in your relationship? Mm. They're the kind of things that I'm also interested in yeah. and, and I can be if a player wishes can talk about those things. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it was good because you you certainly educated me that uh, when a football club looks at, oh, we need a coach, we need a nutritionist, we need a physical trainer and a doctor and a physio mm. and blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Let's get a chaplain for their overall well-being. Yeah. So we're going to go to Adam and Adrian and they're going to share some kingdom keys and we're going to come back with David Hutton on the couch. Thanks, Pamela. You know, this week we're gonna talk about laughter. See, laughter is very, very powerful. And even uh, uh, in medical science, they reckon that laughing can actually heal you. Uh, it's actually proven for that. But there is supernatural laughter and there is joy that comes from heaven. You know, right now in heaven, there's a party and there's a lot of joy and laughing that's going on. Unfortunately, in hell, and this is a place where we choose to go to, there's a lot of crying and weeping. But in heaven, God, his plan is for us to be in heaven where there's a lot of joy and peace. You know, when Jesus was born and he was born in Bethlehem, these shepherds were out in the field and these angels appeared to the shepherds and he said, fear not, because they were freaked out and said, fear not, we come to give you great good news with great joy. And this is God's plan for us to be in joy. You know, when I think of laughter, I think of Isaac, mm. Abraham's son, unexpected, and then he was given a promise and he was to call his son Isaac, which means laughter. All right, and so the promise was laughter. When the promise is received, why not laugh? That's right. You've got the victory. Mm. And there's a lot of laughter when you get a revelation of the promise. You know, when a stronghold has fallen in the unseen world, a demonic power has broken off. I actually see people laughing in the joy. They're set free because the promise of the revelation of the promise is released to them. This is very, very exciting. Some people mock us with this ministry of people laughing in the presence of God. You know, someone wrote to us and said, you know, uh, Adrian's ministry is great, the teaching, but the laughter, with, with, when Adam releases that laughing, he said, they, they wrote to us and said, this is totally irrelevant irrelevant to the Lord so we just said well okay well we love you but be miserable then so this is very very powerful you know it says in Psalms it says Psalms 2 he who sits in the heavenlies laughs laughs and so you know we live in Australia and we have kookaburras and if you were to see a kookaburra or you were to see a kookaburra in a dream often that can depict that laughter or God we, we sing a song here kookaburra sits in the old gum tree Mary Mary king of the bush is he he is like God sitting in heaven laughing at a situation yeah laughing at the enemy yes. laughing at demonic powers because they are nothing and we have the victory see you next week welcome David Hutton now David you you have quite an extraordinary CV You've done many things, and um, and again associated with the Port Adelaide Football Club, and you were the football development manager, looking after. 
Uh, yes, I was player development manager from 2000 to 2000 and the end of 2007 season yeah. at Port Adelaide yeah. uh, in the AFL. So I was full-time player welfare and development manager, did some other work in and around football operations, but yeah. uh, worked closely with Bran and through that time, who was yeah. our chaplain, because of all the, the, the welfare side of things that I was yeah. looking after with the, uh, the players at the club. Yeah. So what does that actually mean? I mean, people um, throw titles around. Mm. So, I mean, I understand what the development is, but, but player welfare, what does, what does that mean to you? You yeah, look, um, and look, there are two types of develop, player development managers, one mm. on field, uh, but this, the welfare and development was all off field. So okay. uh, I didn't do any of the, the skills. We had enough coaches. Oh, really? I'm so uh, disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so it was really looking after the, the players we, we had uh, at the time, uh, 44 mm -hmm. players plus some rookies on mm -hmm. our list. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I was charged with the main responsibility of looking after the players off field mm -hmm. needs and mm -hmm. that would cover everything from when players were drafted to the club, mm -hmm. um, handling relocation if they came from interstate, mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. they didn't just make sure they were settling into becoming a, a full time sure. uh, professional football because in the year 2000 was about when players moved from uh, being part-time, yeah. uh, the yeah. hours were increasing, but from 2000 onwards, they've really mm. been full-time athletes. So, yeah. um, but making sure all of their uh, off-field needs were uh, were being met and mm. that they were also being challenged off-field to, to make sure that uh, uh, they were pursuing, uh, mm -hmm. we, I'd have a spreadsheet on every player and, and show what they were doing away from footy in terms of pursuing their life after football, um, in terms okay, of so, jobs so, and study and yeah. So you've got a secession plan for them, you know, yeah. this, this is not it, you're not yeah. going to be... Um, no, well, I heard uh, Brandon say earlier that yeah. uh, uh, average lifespan of an AFL footballer is less than four years yeah. um, and so for all of those who you see um, make a career out of it yeah. and set themselves up for life by in, being in the system eight, ten, twelve years, there's many who are in the system for one or two or three years and, yeah. and uh, by that time, by the time they come out of the system, uh, all their mates from school would have finished uh, university degrees or mm, apprenticeships. Mm. So it's making sure that they're not too far behind the eight ball yeah. um, for those that, and, and e even those that do play for 10 or 12 years, they're still into their 30s, early 30s if they're lucky. Mm, There's mm. a lot of life to live after that. So it's making yes. sure they're getting skills off the field as well as on the field. Yeah, because life doesn't stop. They still, you know, get married, have children and so on. And so, you know, they're the father, they're the husband. Mm. So there is an obligation, I guess, to provide for the family and if the football money stops what do you do yeah that's right and, and you've you've got now more than half to half your life to live afterwards too yeah. so it's uh, uh and look the players are very good the, the coaches were very supportive mark williams was the coach uh, okay. right through all the, the period that i was at the club yeah. and uh he was very interested in what the players were doing away from football now they couldn't study full-time or have full-time jobs no, but there was probably no. a day and a half a week of idle time mm. that's probably squeezed a little bit more now because i finished working yeah. in the system in 2008 but uh, just to make sure that they were chipping away at some part-time studies yeah. uh, making sure it was something that one interested them two had a meaningful mm. outcome at the end mm. Um, mm. And, uh, and 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 also working through uh, other welfare issues in terms of housing um, mm. family mm. situations mm. Uh, just making sure that they were as settled as, as they could be yeah. uh, so yeah. improving as people but also being able mm. to be settled within their lifestyle to, to get the best out of them footy wise and uh, Financial management, I guess, you know, would, would you assist them with that? Because, you know, they, some of them are on big contracts mm. and, and, and even for ones that aren't on big contracts, it's still a lot more money than they possibly would have been earning. Yeah, as an and they need to be thinking about setting themselves up for the future. So, yeah. look, that was something... The club, in conjunction with the AFL Players Association, mm. the, the Players Association is a, is a very active body in terms of helping provide assistance mm. for education, helping provide mm. a range of different uh, workshops, sort of personal mm. and professional development workshops that mm. clubs can tap into. So at okay. Port Adelaide, we tried to be as proactive as we could in mm. working with the Players Association. Um, the financial management's interesting because uh, right through the 2000s was when player agents, player managers were uh, okay. really coming to the fore. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of those organisations do it very well and, mm. and really look after the players um, mm. in terms of the financial mm. advice. Oh, well, well that's good. Others don't sure. do it as well. So yeah. it was really um, working through, uh, trying to work out, did the player have the right, yeah, and some of them had 
uh, accountants in their family. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, you didn't have a blanket rule. You worked with each no. player and it sort of did, did a needs analysis and, yeah. and then knew who you had to work with in, in particular areas. Yeah. yeah. But then there's life for you after football. So yeah. you, you've moved on out. Of well, you're yeah, still well, involved, I, obviously. Yeah, and, and look, I, I played football myself, not at AFL level, but uh, SANFL level, uh, back okay. in the 80s and 90s with Port Adelaide in the I State know. League. Brandon told me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, and uh, so we were very part time, semi professional back then, but yeah. um, worked in IT for 10 years, then got involved in, had the opportunity to, to get involved in football administration. And mm. prior to that, eight years with the power, I, I had spent three years as CEO of the Port Adelaide Magpies. Okay. Um, and then moved from there to the power. Mm. For, at the end, end of 2007, early 2008, I moved to the SNFL, the State League, mm -hmm. um, and worked as um, uh, in terms of uh, running, uh, managing game development and community okay. engagement. And then had a couple of years outside of football. We're going to come back and we're going to talk some more about your very interesting life and and maybe your interesting father <laughs> and we're just going to go to some commercials and we'll be back in just a moment hi we're back with david hutton and brandon chaplin so welcome back guys and you guys have been friends for a long time yeah we have we uh, we were doing uh, youth camps back in the early 90s and um, so we've been friends ever since yeah. and then we had a lot to do with each other when David was working for the power and I was the chaplain so we mm. were having a weekly interaction um, because David was looking after player welfare and I guess I was one little piece in that player yeah. where welfare pu puzzle so mm. you yeah, know we've had this friendship for mm. nearly 25 years now yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, we ran the, the Baptist Easter youth camps years ago with uh, okay. with our wives, and yeah, still yeah. Uh, still good friends and, and love catching up. That's good. Mm. That's really good. But you have moved into the not for profit organisations, you know, in in a couple of different areas, the Sammy D Foundation. Uh, just explain to people who may not know, because outside of you know the show goes nationally, but it yeah, also sure. goes internationally. Mm. Explain to people what who Sammy okay. was. Okay, so Sammy D is Sam Davis, uh, mm. and he was unfortunately uh, lost his life in 2008 in a one-punch incident. Mm. Innocent victim, uh, mm. some gate crashes at a party. His parents, uh, Neil Davis and Nat Cook, started up a foundation in in his name, mm. uh, and essentially the foundation runs education and training programs mm. uh, about party safe behaviours, drug and alcohol education, looking out for your mates. Mm. Um, uh, in schools and sporting clubs in particular mm. um, and also mm. uh, we do some youth mentoring activities for, for at-risk youth. Mm. Uh, so yeah I, I spent the uh, best part of a couple of years working in a, in a couple of different roles there. I'm now not working with the foundation but on the board on the and board, on the fundraising yeah. committee uh, yeah. helping support the, the great mm. work they do but uh, mm. money's tough uh, to get for those sorts of organisations but yeah. a, a fa fantastic organisation and Nat and Neil you take your ha hat off to them what they've yeah. done in, in the face yeah. of some tragic circumstances to to try and stop anyone else going through what they've gone exactly. through. Exactly. I mean, because anything like that is shocking, you know, to leave your, lose your child anyway. Mm. But yeah. in those sort of circumstances, you just think... Yeah, just it senseless. It must be surreal. Mm. Mm. But to to really suck it up mm. and, um, and go on and help others. Mm. Now they've got a fantastic. They've done a fantastic job with the foundation. Mm. Uh, employ some youth workers who help deliver the programs and yeah. run the mentoring. Um, yeah, Neil good. works in in the foundation himself. Nat's mm. gone on to be a Labor politician. Uh, she's an MP mm. uh, in the southern suburbs here in Adelaide. But mm. uh, yeah, great foundation uh, and great people. Mm. Mm. So what else are you involved in? Yeah, so I uh, I then uh, went back here, so still supporting the foundation in a voluntary capacity, mm -hmm. uh, had, a, had the opportunity to get back into sports administration and management, but yeah. uh, after having 18 years in football, it was uh, time for a change. So I'm mm. uh, CEO of Rowing South Australia, Rowing yeah. SA. We're based down on the, the rowing course down at West Lakes, Lakes and yeah. uh, I started there at Christmas time this year. Mm. So uh, hadn't been involved in rowing before, so a new sport to me, but mm. great people, great sport. Um, mm good culture and uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying my time there and mm. uh, having to, l to learn quick. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you'll produce some Olympians. <laughs> well, we had uh, South Australia had five 
uh, representatives in the Olympic team who competed oh, really? over in Rio. Yeah, and in cool. fact, two of our men won silver medals, one in the men's four and one in the men's quad crew. Excellent. Um, yeah, Alex Hill and James McRae. Yeah. So yeah, we have had some success at national level, but certainly looking to, to broaden the, the yeah. pool and, and get yeah. some more up there for Tokyo. Exactly, hmm. exactly. Hmm. So, so what drives you, David? What, what's your passion? Uh, what drives me? Good, good question. Um, look, I love working with people. I started my, my education backgrounds uh, uh, my tertiary education is in IT and I worked in IT mm. for 10 years, but I pretty soon quickly found out I wasn't a, an, an IT boffin <laughs> in the background. I, I got into more team leadership, people management roles. Which there was led, no one to talk to, was there? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. So uh, hey, David is very much the people guy. So exactly. Right <laughs> um, so, well, look, and I love sport. Uh, mm. I played sport. My wife and kids are involved in a range of different sports. Mm. And so working in sport, seeing the benefits of sport and healthy physical activity. So to be able to combine that for so many years as mm. my profession, mm. um, it's, uh, it's been really, really been a blessing. But, uh, but yeah. that and then I've had a lot of um, uh, other interest in, in working with my church, local Baptist church mm -hmm. and youth work. Uh, mm -hmm. So working with young people, helping empower young people to yeah. be the best they can. and. Uh, and know that they're they're valued and and to make something of their lives mm. and um, yeah I'm, I'm on the board of Baptist Care as well so got a, a passion for for people and community yeah. I just think it all comes for down social to social justice. Mm. You were brought up in a Christian family mm -hmm. and that was really quite a strong influence on your life. Yes, yeah, certainly it was. Uh, Mum and Dad uh, grew up uh, in the Baptist church down yeah. at Semaphore and, and Mum and Dad were a great example. Uh, of uh, Christian parents and instilling that in uh, myself, brother and sister, and mm. uh, my wife and I have sort of carried that in into our own family with our two kids. Yeah, that's powerful. Mm. Brandon, you weren't. Yeah, it was, a sl it was slightly different. I certainly wasn't a week by week Sunday church experience in my home. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a hostile home or anything like no. that, but um, there were some influences. But yeah, I, I kind of had this radical moment at uh, 19 years of age and I was invited by a cousin to a meeting. I heard the gospel preached and yeah, basically to use a football term, I, I had a sh bit of a shirt front experience <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sort of met Jesus. I didn't know anything about him. I had this little Red Gideon's Testament I'd been oh, given okay. in year eight at school. And I, I, I proceeded to read that to get to know this Jesus that I'd met because I knew nothing about him. I basically was pretty clueless. So I would yeah. read through uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and, and try and understand this Jesus who, who, who confronted me really yeah, at wow. 19, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so it's a myth to think that you have to be brought up in a Christian background to be a pastor. Here you are pastoring one of the most successful churches in Adelaide. Well, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a radical moment. And uh, my sister had actually been going to um, a Baptist church in the hills and she'd mm. been going to youth group. And so I had this moment and I spoke to her and I said, I, I feel I've got to go to church now. And she said, come along with me. And yeah. I've actually been in that church ever since. And now I'm the senior pastor of it. So it's a fairly <laughs> bizarre story. But that goes so that's back. the key. You just stick it out. So, yeah. <laughs> 30 years have passed and I'm still in the same Christian community. They can't get rid of him. No. <laughs> so I, I think that's so encouraging for everyone listening. You know, parents who, who may in fact be in despair because their children haven't come to the Lord, but also for, for parents who are Christians, you know, never, never undervalue what influence you have on your children because you know David's here and Brandon's here as testimonies to the work of Jesus Christ in their life. So I'm Pamela Signeri. Thank you guys. It's Thank been you. a delight talking with you and this is Firestarters TV and I look forward to seeing you next time.